Hello everyone and welcome to One Civil Law. For today's case, we have the case of Dan Chisholm and Reed Linninger versus the St. Marty City School. This is a case out of Ohio before the Sixth Circuit. In this case, two football students were called very aggressive and mean names by their coach, including sexual names that were normally reserved for females, but were being in a derogatory way, but were being used at them in a derogatory way. So they're claiming intentional infliction of emotional distress and claiming violation of Title IX, which prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex. So we're going to read a little bit of this, see what happened to these students, and see whether or not it rises to the level that can be achieved through recovery. So let's get started with this. First, we have to talk a little bit about this football coach and the kind of behavior he tended to engage in. Doug Fry has been teaching high school football in Northern Ohio for a quarter century. Allegations that Fry harassed players under his watch are nearly as old. The first came in 1995. While coaching at the Berkus City Schools, Fry was given a written reprimand for using unacceptable obscene language and becoming physical with one of the players. That conduct repeated itself when Fry took a co coaching position at St. Mary's City School starring in 1998. Just a year into the job, Fry was rebuked in writing by members of his coaching staff for subjecting the players to degrading language and pushing them to play through injuries. Sounds like an upstanding guy. Fry left his position at St. Mary's in the spring of 2010. That fall, he took a position as head high school football coach in neighboring Wapakanoa. And once again, Fry's behavior became the source of player grievance. In 2010, Fry was accused of harassing the players. Several students even went so far as to file a criminal complaint against Fry. These allegations were supported by a recording of Fry swearing repeatedly and calling his players derogatory names. An investigation by the Ohio Department of Education ensued. That investigation resulted in them reaching a consent agreement. Under the agreement, Fry retained his teaching license and a coaching permit, but Fry's employer for two years was required to submit quarterly reports to the Department of Education addressing Fry's behavior and treatment of students. The school district then renewed Fry's position as a head coach for 2013, but following that season, he voluntarily resigned. Ten miles away at St. Mary's Memorial High School, the plaintiffs began their high school careers. During the plaintiffs' early year, the team struggled. Over the 2012 and 2013 seasons, the teams went winless, posting a record of 0-20. to And by and large, these games were not close. During the two seasons, St. Mary's was outscored by a collective margin of nearly 3-1. to Not the greatest football team, yeah. On the heels of the futility, and nice word choice, the St. Mary's school board decided to replace the head coach. To fill this position, the board turned to Fry, who was well known to St. Mary's for his prior coaching tenure at the school and reputation for running a winning program. With full knowledge of Fry's history and disciplinary incidents, Superintendent Sean Brown signed off on Fry's rehiring due to Fry's continued success for several years at other schools following the complaints made against him. So even though you had full knowledge of this guy and full knowledge of his behavior, you decide to employ him because of his winning record. Okay, fair enough. The decision, however, divided the St. Mary's community. Some community members enthusiastically supported the rehiring, but others opposed rehiring given his troubled past. Mindful of the concerns, Brown resolved to monitor Fry's behavior. One of the students claimed that his negative relationship with Fry began upon Fry's arrival. During the first months of Fry's tenure, the student attended off-season weightlifting sessions. At those sessions, the student stated that Fry called him soft and entitled. Though Fry also said similar things to other players, the student felt that Fry targeted him specifically by criticizing him in front of the entire team. As the 2014 season kicked off, Fry did not relent. On a daily basis, Fry called the students and their teammates various names, including derogatory name for female, derogatory name for female, and pretty boy. Fry also continued to make an example of the student, complaining that it was impossible to win with players who wasted their talents like the student. Some of the student's teammates even joined in, calling Linninger derogatory name for female and soft. Unlike that student, this other student did not clash with Fry during the first season back at St. Mary's, but this student had other problems. Off the field, he got into trouble at school, and on the field, he was ejected from the game for punching a player on the opposing team a couple of times. I would think that qualifies as a reason to eject 
punching the player. That's not within good sportsmanlike conduct, new. Chisholm even was briefly removed from the team after he was caught smoking on school grounds. Though Chisholm was ultimately allowed back on the team, Fry made clear that similar conduct would not be tolerated. But the relationship quickly soured. According to Fry, the students started openly questioning the coaching methods. Fry responded by again calling the student names at practice. This conflict came to a head after the penultimate game of St. Mary's season, when Fry and some team members accused the students of throwing the game by intentionally misdirecting a snap. Following this incident, the teammates voted him off the team, a decision Fry and Holloman, the athletic director, allowed to stand. So he's being kicked off by his teammates because they believe he intentionally misfouled a staff, staff to throw the game. Okay, right, let's press on. And I guess go Lone Star State too, for that matter. Friendship. Okay. Following the student's removal from the team, the student's father contacted the other student's father to discuss the treatment of their sons. The student's father also reached out to other members of the team, finding some of whom agreed with the two fathers' complaint. After speaking with parents about the conduct, the two fathers decided to engage an attorney. At the father's behest, their attorney sent a letter to Brown and Holloman requesting the removal of Fry and his staff, both as coaches and teachers. The St. Mary's School Board initiated an investigation into Fry's conduct. The board retained Dr. Ted Knapp, a former superintendent of the two districts who had previously conducted a similar investigation for another district. On behalf of the board, Knapp interviewed 11 players and some of their parents, along with most of the coaching staff, but he did not interview the student in question or his father. In his report, Knapp concluded that the allegations against Fry, while serious, were unsupported by findings of the investigation. Coaches and students acknowledged that Fry's intermittent swearing, but Knapp concluded that he did not believe the conduct was inappropriate. In its final report, the Ohio Department of Education determined that no disciplinary action against Fry was necessary. Following the controversy, Fry remained the head coach at St. Mary's. Chisholm finished his senior year and enlisted in the Army, where I'm sure he received no abuse of the kind he had received ever again. Still a junior, the other student transferred to nearby and high school where he played receiver for the varsity football team and was chosen for homecoming. Despite these achievements, the student claims that he suffered severe emotional distress for the remainder of the time in high school. So the one student went off to join the army to escape being taunted and ridiculed, and the other student transferred to another high school and is claiming emotional distress that despite you know, his being a player, despite his being on homecoming court, he continues to be haunted by those horrible, horrible words. So what happens next? The plaintiffs filed separate complaints in federal court. Each alleged federal due process, equal protection, 1983, and Title IX claims, along with state law claims for intentional and negligent infliction of emotional distress against the same defendants, the St. Mary Board of Education and the athletic director and the coach. The district court denied all the claims. The plaintiffs appealed pursuing only the Title IX and intentional infliction of emotional distress. We consolidated the two cases for appeal. So a couple things happening there, right? You have two cases that are happening at trial that are basically the same facts or substantially the same facts. They're both going to appeal, and so the appeal court does what it often does, consolidates. It takes a whole bunch of cases and smushes them into one case and says, well, we're only going to hear this case once. So, you know, that's not untypical. Uh, courts do it all the time. If there's a lot of different cases that are similar enough, you know, consolidate. No problem, so that's what's happening. And they decide to appeal only the Title IX and the intentional infliction of emotional distress, so that's all the court's going to decide. Okay. Viewing the record in the light most favorable to plaintiffs, the district court concluded that plaintiffs' Title IX and intentional infliction of emotional distress claims were insufficient as a matter of law. Reviewing those conclusions from the start, we agree. Even accepting plaintiffs' factual allegations are true, they are nonetheless insufficient as a matter of law to warrant relief. Yeah, that makes sense, particularly in the light of intentional infliction. Intentional infliction of emotional distress is a pretty hard trigger to pull because it gets into free speech issues. So, you know, when you're talking about intentional infliction, it requires a lot more than this kind of taunting. A lot more. We're not, we're not close to what IIED had in mind, no. In enacting Title IX, Congress sought to curb discrimination in federally funded educational institutions, such as public high schools, left unaddressed by the Civil Rights Act. Unlike its landmark predecessor, however, Title IX only prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex. 
no person in the United States on the basis of sex shall be excluded from participation in, deny benefit of, or subject to discrimination under any educational program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Other forms of discrimination, while they may run afoul of another safeguard, do not implicate Title IX. So here, as always, the court is pointing out, you know, that you have to look to each cause of action separately. You might have a cause of action somewhere else, but at the moment, all we're talking about is Title IX. So even if this triggers something else, we don't care because that's not the issue before us. All that we're concerned with is Title IX. Okay. To sustain a claim under Title IX, a plaintiff must show that a person or entity affiliated with a federally funded educational program engaged in some sort of sex-based discrimination against the plaintiff. One of these threshold matters, once these threshold matters are established, the plaintiff must take make three additional showings. The sex-based harassment was so severe, pervasive, and objectively offensive, it could have been said to deprive the plaintiff of access to the educational opportunities or benefits provided by the school, the school had actual knowledge of the harassment, and the school was deliberately indifferent as to the harassment. Plaintiff's Title IX theory is somewhat unusual. It hinges entirely on Fry's use of derogatory terms normally used for females. Plaintiff says the use of this term was a form of sex discrimination due to its gender-based connotation. To the plaintiff's mind, the team portrayed them as feminine and thus seemingly less valuable teammates in a masculine setting of football, revealing Fry's favoritism of one sex over another. And because, plaintiff add, Fry's repeated use of the term ultimately denied them educational benefit of Fry's conduct ran afoul of Title IX. We therefore must decide whether a high school football coach use of this term in connection with football-related activities is enough to implicate Title IX protections. So are these three criteria met? Viewing this through the Title VII inspired lens, because we're looking to other statutes to help interpret this statute, which is very typical. So interpreting it through that lens, uh, which also goes to sex discrimination is one of the reasons they're using it, but it's sex education, sex discrimination in employment. So they're looking at it as a parallel. Plaintiff allegations fail to satisfy any of the three traditional routes for establishing Title IX liability. Starting with the first route, whether Fry made sexual advances or acted out sexual desire, even when viewing the record in the light most favorable to the plaintiff, that type of evidence is absent. In fact, no allegation regarding sexual desire has been raised in this case. The same is true of the second route, whether Fry was motivated by genuine hostility to the presence of men. If anything, the evidence is much to the contrary. Fry, after all, dedicated many years of his life to coaching and developing male students he supervised. So too for the third route, whether Fry treated men and women differently in the mixed-sex environment. That St. Mary's football team had no female members seems to foreclose this route to Title IX relief. So yeah, it's, it's nowhere close to what Title IX was attempting to do. Because there's no female members, you can't discriminate on the basis of sex. It seems plausible. Yeah, there, there, there are definitely exceptions, guys. Definitely exceptions, both to negligent infliction of emotional distress and intentional infliction of emotional distress. There definitely are exceptions. But, you know, it's being balanced against freedom of speech. And especially in intentional infliction, the courts look for quite a lot. So, yeah, if you're, if you're telling a woman that her child had died and you know that's not true, then, yeah, you're probably a lot closer to intentional infliction because a reasonable person would take that and be shocked, you know? So it's like you're, in, you're ensuing emotional distress. So there is some line, you know, but it has to, it has to you know, shock the conscious, as it were. Of course, the plaintiffs cannot be faulted for finding the use of the term offensive, even in a football setting, but crude and vulgar language alone does not rise to the level of a Title IX violation. After all, Titles IX and VII are not a general civility code. To Fry, the term was a vehicle for criticizing male athletes for not acting in an aggressive or tough enough manner. Yet the mere use of an offensive or gender term does not in and of itself rise to the level of determination of discrimination on the basis of sex. Um, El Rio Grande, I hope I got it right that time. Um, when you're talking about the severity of the damage, you're going to damages, not to the issue of underlying liability. So damages is part of the tort analysis, but it's at the end of the tort analysis. So like the degree to which the person did or did not suffer is not the threshold question. The threshold question is whether or not the the conduct was so severe as to defy society's bounds of, you know, all decency and shock the conscious and so forth and so on. So, like, if you said 
to a woman, your child had died, knowing it to be false, even intending that it caused distress, but it not caused distress, then you're probably still liable for intentional infliction of emotional distress. I mean, at that point, you're only getting nominal damages because it didn't actually cause distress. But, you know, you're still liable for it because you met the threshold. So the, if you suffer from PTSD, it tells you the amount of damage. It doesn't tell you anything about whether the underlying conduct was wrongful. Because I could tell you my favorite color is blue. You get PTSD. I'm definitely not responsible for that. So, yeah. And, and, and this, is, this, is, this is actually somewhat timely because wasn't it Elon Omar who just said, I think today, that Trump's State of the Union triggered her? It actually triggered her into an anxiety reaction? So that would be a good example of where, assuming that to be true, that'd be a good example of where harm to a person does not indicate that the, that the person speaking has committed any wrong. So, yeah. Second, and of even greater significance, the qualities complained of in the prior case law were not related to those plaintiffs' ability to perform well in their jobs. Here, by comparison, Fry's abusive language targeted a fundamental requirement for football players, toughness. By his remarks, Fry was not offering a commentary on whether the students were exemplars of their sex. I always love the word exemplar. For better or use, Fry's comments were about playing football and not gender roles. Fry thought that the student's performance as quarterback suffered because of a fear of being hit by player of the opposing teams, and he criticized the student for sitting out games and practices due to injury. To Fry's somewhat boorish mind, the terms he used was a wimp or coward, perhaps equivalent to snowflake in the current lexicon. Resilience, strong will, and even a possibly a measure of disregard for one's physical well-being are necessary ingredients for success in football, and that is true of male and female players alike. So basically saying that this is kind of part and parcel what you signed up for. So maybe this kind of language would be problematic elsewhere. Maybe if it was a person using it in a classroom, it would be a problem. But like many things in law, it's context dependent. And this particular context, you know, you're going to be hit by players. So you're expecting a little bit more. And so basically the thing is you signed up for this. It's voluntary. So, you know, this was to be expected. So you can't get relief. Makes sense to me. El Rio Grande, I'm perfectly with you, man. I, I'm sorry for your PTSD. I, I truly am. I'm even more sorry that it's being co-opted for these political purposes. Because now it's like yours is being taken less seriously. It's totally inappropriate. It's like, yeah, I, 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 I have many, many issues with the far left, as you might expect. Elon Omar and Tlaib and Ocasio-Cortez are not exactly my views of what representatives should be. So, yeah. In addition to the federal Title IX claim, plaintiffs also claimed that the conduct amounted to intentional infliction of emotional distress, a state law claim. According to the plaintiffs, the conduct caused the student to, de de to develop depression and anxiety, which made it more difficult for him to make friends at a new school. Under Ohio's common law, a claim for intentional infliction of emotional distress requires a four-factor test, that the actor either intended to cause emotional distress or knew or should have known it would result in serious emotional distress, the actor's conduct was so extreme and outrageous as to go beyond all possible bounds of decency and was such that it can be considered as utterly intolerable in a civilized community, so requiring quite a lot, the actor's actions were the proximate cause of the plaintiff's psyche injury and the mental anguish suffered by the plaintiff is serious and of a nature that no reasonable man could be expected to endure. For purposes of the argument, we assume this coach, by his comment, intended to cause emotional distress for the first factor. We likewise assume the third factor, the content was proximate cause, to be established. However, neither of the students can show that the conduct was so extreme and outrageous as to go beyond all possible bounds of decency, let alone conduct considered as utterly intolerable in a civilized community as required by the second factor. So even assuming we give you the other factors, there's no way you can meet this factor. It's just nowhere near what you need for intentional affliction of emotional distress. I am fully agree. It is, it is well below the threshold, no problem. Ohio law sets a high bar for establishing emotional distress claim, as do many states for exactly this reason. To clear the bar, a plaintiff must show outrageous conduct. Hurt feelings caused by insults, their threats, and other indignities are not outrageous. 
This is not to say we condone Fry's comments. They're offensive and inappropriate at best. But they're also, also not unheard of on the gridiron, where a foul-mouthed coach is something of an unfortunate cultural cliché. All things considered, Fry statements were not utterly intolerable in a community. For similar reasons, we cannot say, as required by the final factor, that any emotional anguish suffered was severe and of a nature that no reasonable man can be expected to endure. As we've said, the comments were harsh, pointed, and intended to demean. Yet even intense name-calling is not something no reasonable man can be expected to endure, especially on a football field. In other words, grow a pair. You know, this is not what we had in mind. There is a level somewhere. This is not it. You have hurt feelings, you know. Grow up, I guess. The highest in the squad is AOC with 12%. I did not know that. That pleases me. Thank you for informing me. So that is the end of the case from the Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit by way of Ohio in the case of Dan Chisholm and Reed Linninger versus the St. Mary City School. In this case, we learned that two football players were said some unfortunately mean things, mean words to these students. And the students suffered some harm, or so they said. And the Court of Appeals said, okay, no, this isn't a violation of Title IX. It's not a violation of a general civility code. You know, it's not severe, it's not pervasive, and any of these things. And no, it's not intentional infliction of emotional distress, because intentional infliction of emotional distress requires quite a lot more. It's definitely possible, but we're nowhere even close to it in this situation. So as to you students, um, we would suggest that you grow up a little bit and realize that this is to be anticipated and expected in this environment. You chose to be there, and so, you know, that's part and parcel. If it were in the classroom, we'd be talking, but we're not in the classroom. We're on the football field. And as always, context matters, and that is the end of this case. Thank you for joining me as we both read this case together and now better understand the law. If you're enjoying this legal education content, please subscribe to this channel. It really helps us grow. And check out one of our other videos, including the one that's currently being displayed on the thumbnail on screen. Thank you so much for your continued support. And until later, my friends, cheers and goodbye.